Hi, what I will do in this presentation is to talk about uh, first a little bit about experimental testing, but then focus on the difference between linear and nonlinear viscoelastic viscoplastic material models. And I'll do this both from a little bit of theory and a little bit of uh, hands on demonstrations where I compare different material models. So, so let's get started. Um, first, a few words about myself. Uh, I am the founder and principal uh, manager of Polymer FEM. I'm also the lead developer of our software products, M Calibration and PolyUMOD. I wrote a book, Mechanics of Solid Polymers, a few years ago. And I really spent my career talking about and working in this area of nonlinear modeling of different polymer materials. And I'm happy to talk to you here in this uh, meeting and this uh, about a little bit what I learned and how you can think about these problems to get better predictions in your own finite element simulations. So the outline of my presentation today is a little bit of experimental testing and then strength and weaknesses of linear and nonlinear viscoplasticity. Note that I'm not going to talk about continuum mechanics. I'm not going to talk about uh, the deep theory. I'm not going to talk about anisotropic materials. It's going to keep it kind of basic in this discussion. But the key is to talk about the differences between nonlinear and linear plasti viscoplasticity. So, Let's get started with some uh, discussion about smart testing, experimental testing. And the first question I like to ask people really is to think about why you do experimental tests. What are the reasons for it? Uh, there are many reasons uh, that are listed for here that I could think of. One is, of course, quality control and data sheet creation. So if you work in a company that sells a polymer material of, of some kind, you need to have a data sheet that your customers can uh, look at to, in order to pick a material, basically, right? So those are good reasons to run experimental tests. Uh, but if your goal is to come up with a material model, and make sure your material model is a good material model uh, that can be used in finite element simulations, then you need to do a different kind of test. Uh, this is what I call smart testing. You may also want to do validation experiments to make sure that the accuracy of your FE simulations in the end are as good as you like. So what is this smart testing? Uh, well, it's a type of test where you get a lot of information from a little bit of work. So that's pretty good, right? Who wouldn't want that? Um, and the, the idea here is that smart testing, uh, it really is, is supposed to give you all of this in, in a quick way. And here are some examples of, of tests that are perhaps of this category. So if you load the material in tension and then hold it, unload it, hold it, unload it, and keep doing these cycles, you get information about the loading response, of course, the unloading response, the relaxation response at different strains. And that can really be a very useful uh, information for a viscoelastic, viscoplastic material model. You can also extend this to do repeated cycles at each strain level to get a little bit of information about the damage if there is damage in your material by doing repeated cycles so there are many different ways of doing this uh, type of testing and uh, here's another example that i like because it's 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 kind of interesting to just look at the graph here if you load unload uh, to larger and larger strains but in this case you can also hold the strain constant at each peak value of strain you get information about the uh, the relaxation response as a function of strain. You get uh, information about the unloading response as a function of strain in both tension and compression. Pretty smart, right? A lot of information with little work, one specimen in this particular case. So that's something to think about. How about loading modes? This is something that a lot of people think uh, uh, not so much about, right? They're just going to run some experiments and, and be done with it. But you should carefully, of course, think about is, is what's best for me, a tension test, torsion test, or what? And how many of these should I run? And uh, it clearly, that's an important question, right? And um, I'm not going to go into the details in our short presentation today, but the idea is that the number of different loading modes you need to test will depend on the material model that you want to use in the end. And I typically recommend, uh, for simplicity, to use I1-based hyperelastic models in your viscoelastic material model. Of course, they always go together. So if you use I1-based hyperelasticity as the base component, then it's okay to use only one high, uh, loading mode. You don't need to do more than that. Uh, so let's leave it like that for now. 
Next topic is linear viscoelasticity. So linear viscoelasticity, remember, is a combination here of hyperelastic plus a prony series. And linear viscoelasticity is a superposition kind of idea. You have to specify either the instantaneous or the long-term hyperelastic response, and then some kind of relaxation modulus. The theory is really cool, actually. If you were to study this a little bit more deeper, you will see that the, it, it has some interesting uh, mathematical features to it. But you know, if you're, if you're working as an engineer, you may not care so much about it. Uh, but there is kind of some interesting uh, symmetry in the model there. Hi, as my first example, I'm going to show you how you can uh, look at DMA data in frequency space like this. How does linear viscoelasticity predict this response? And this is such an easy example. I'm just going to do it live uh, using a live demonstration. So let me find experimental data first. Um, here is a file that I want to work with. Um, it's a CSV file, and I can open it. And I see there are five columns with these uh, types of data in them. So to use this, I just open up a new window of M calibration. Here it is. And then I'll read in the experimental data by clicking on the plus sign here. I switch the load case type to be dynamic DMA data. I specify the name of the file. And here it is. Uh, it's a CSV file that we just looked at. And uh, I just double check that these columns are correct for the data that we have. And it is. Then I'll just say OK and OK. So here's my experimental data uh, that I want to work with. I'm going to change the plot on the right here so that it's a log scale. And there it is. We'll see that at this, the storage modulus increases and loss modulus has a peak. Uh, let's take a look at the linear viscoelastic material model. I was going to pick the abacus hyperelastic viscoelastic model here. It asks for a number of prony series of terms. But we don't need to worry about that. The software will uh, specify for us how many prony series terms it thinks is necessary, depending on what data is available uh, in this particular case. So here is the default guess that the um, M calibration provides to us. I can just click Run once, and we'll see that this is the prediction. Let me just change the color here so we can see the predicted uh, behavior a little better. And see that the predictions are absolutely fantastic in terms of the storage modulus. It's a little bit off on the loss modulus, but not too bad. This indicates how easy it is to work with a linear viscoelastic material model when you have uh, frequency domain data. But how about if you have a, another data set? So I have another example here. Uh, so if you have data that looks sort of like this, loading unloading uh, cycles with some stress relaxation is this the type of data that you can predict using linear viscoelasticity let's take a look so i will open a window of m calibration so we can uh, take a look at that data and uh, here is here is the data already read into m calibration and um, if you go through the calibration procedure that I outlined in some of my other tutorials, you can come up with a prediction that looks like this uh, for linear viscoelasticity. The dashed lines are the predictions, and the solid lines are the uh, experimental predictions. We we'll see that um, the viscoelastic model uh, is not able to predict all aspects of this data very well. The overall fitness is about 11%, which is not all that bad, but you can see that the initial modulus is way off here for that particular strain rate. And it's equally off, it's about half, a factor of two here. So the maximum error is very large in this case, not so good. The question is, can we do better than this? And the, the answer is yes, we can certainly predict this data set much more accurately, but it does require leaving linear viscoelasticity and switching over to nonlinear viscoelasticity. So that's uh, the next topic I wanna to talk about here. So what is uh, nonlinear viscoelasticity? Well, it's, it's an extension of linear viscoelasticity. You often can think of it as having many parallel networks as indicated in this rheological image here. Each network has a spring, which is a hyperelastic network, and each uh, dash plot is a flow element that needs to be uh, specified. They are not linear dash plots, they are nonlinear. And there are many different uh, examples of, of these kinds of models. There are the Bergstrom-Boyce model. It's one of them that I developed a number of years ago. 
There are also more modern, higher uh, number of elements and network representations. They work really well. The, the key here is that these types of nonlinear viscoelastic materials work really well. And the trick is really to select the type of elements you need in the models. So let me start by uh, showing you how this would look for the example we just had. So this is our experimental data with the predictions from the linear viscoelastic model. If I switch over to my saved solution for the three network viscoelastic model, so I select it here, I load it into the active region and I run it once, we'll see that the predictions now are have much better. The average error is less than 4% instead of 11%, and it matches both the initial modulus and the cyclic response of the material. So this is the kind of value enhancement you get by switching from linear viscoelastic to nonlinear viscoelasticity. Uh, the average error goes down in the case by a factor of two, and the maximum error goes down even more. So it's a pretty powerful technique uh, to use. I'm going to show you another example. Uh, so here's another example. Um, if you have experimental data that looks like this, loading followed by unload, I mean relaxation and then unloading at multiple strain rates. Um, this is purely experimental data in this case. And the question is, what material model can predict this in an accurate way? And um, they're, they're pretty clear that linear viscoelasticity is not going to be so good. Here's the best prediction I can come up with a linear viscoelastic model. The, error, the average error is 30%. It looks absolutely terrible at large strains, obviously. The trends are all wrong. Not a good idea to use linear viscoelasticity in a case like this. And if you switch over to a nonlinear viscoelastic material model, again, this is the poly-U mod 3 network viscoelastic model, the TNV model. There is, is less than 1, 2%. It's fantastic. The average, every aspect of the stress strain response is pretty much uh, captured very well. And um, the, what's interesting in a case like this is that if you switch over to another similar looking material model, like the Abacus PRF model, this is the 3 network uh, power Mullins model that it's in M calibration is very easy to use, but you can see that the error, even though it has a low value, 2% average error, the actual uh, predictions are not as robust. We have a permanent strain here that's more than twice as large, large as it should be uh, with this kind of prediction here. So adding plasticity obviously would make it even worse. So this is an example where uh, the PRF model in Abacus, although it's often useful, is not often as good as the uh, polyu mod TNV model. So to summarize this in a few different uh, graphs, here is uh, some of the models that shouldn't be used. Linear elastic, uh, of course, hyperelasticity doesn't work. Uh, linear viscoelasticity does not work either. There are a number of other models that work much better. Here's the average error. It's kind of interesting to look at the average error of the predictions. Uh, when you plot it that way, then the, the poly mod TN and, and the TNV models are very good, but also the PRF models look pretty good. But it's, it's not just the average error that you should be concerned about. If you look at also the, av the maximum error, so that's the upper bar, upper portion of these bars here, we we'll see that the maximum error is very large for some of these models, 40% error in the PRF models that come with Abacus. But the polyuma TN and TV models have a maximum error that's uh, about 10%. So it's significantly better in terms of the, the overall prediction. Um, so to summarize, experimental data is really important to use. Of course, I always recommend using smart testing, uh, which allows you to get more information for less work. Linear viscoelasticity is a kind of an interesting type of model that sometimes works very well, um, but it's not particularly accurate in many cases for large deformations and finite strains. And under those circumstances, I would uh, always basically switch over to nonlinear viscoelasticity, uh, which is uh, this multi-network representation. These models are very accurate. They are actually as easy to use as linear viscoelasticity. And I would say that that's where the future is. Uh, there's going to be more and more emphasis on these multi-network models, nonlinear viscoelasticity of this kind. And finally, of course, the M calibration software makes it very easy to use these nonlinear viscoelastic materials. So take a look at that if you're, uh, if you're interested in these topics and head over to polymerfm.com if you have any questions. Thank you.